Our guest pianist today is Marty Salmon, best known for his work with Buddy Guy. Born and raised on the south side of Chicago, Marty has been performing blues professionally since the age of 15. Beginning in the late 90s, he spent five years playing with Otis Rush before being wooed by another blues giant, Buddy Guy, whose band he's played in regularly now for almost a decade. Joining him today is Rick King on congas, a drummer with Marty for 20 years, whom he met at the Checkerboard Lounge. Rick has toured with Coco Taylor and played with Junior Wells, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, among others. Marty will be performing at the Tribute to Otis Rush on Sunday night at the Petrillo Bandshell as part of the Chicago Blues Festival. It's a rare treat to hear him play as a leader rather than a sideman, so let's give him a warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, Marty Salmon. Good friend hadn't told me I never would have known. I don't believe it, baby. I believe it been lying to me. You're just a two-faced cheating woman. Any blind man could see. so very much. Thank you. 
Marty Salmon, live from Piano Forte on WDCB, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and joined by Rick King on congas. Marty, tell, ab- tell us about the song that uh, we just heard. It was probably the first song I wrote that I made money on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that song I wrote uh, when I made my first record called Hound Dog Barkin, and uh, I needed a first song for the record, something kind of upbeat, so I wrote that, came up with that kind of on the fly. And uh, we've changed it a lot over the years. It's a little more gospel feel now than it used to be. You've got a great left hand, I notice. Thank you. Wish all the women felt like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a lot of b- blues pianists are famous for the right hand, for the upper register, but it's great to hear the left hand really busy. I got in a that good way. from the ragtime background. I studied a lot of Scott oh, really? Joplin and Joseph Lamb and stuff like that. And, uh-huh. and I used to compete in the old time piano playing contest. Really? And uh, all the, I used to see these players with monster left hands, really accurate, uh, jumping around the piano so you could play a bass part and a rhythm part with the left hand. And then all your melody in the right hand is syncopated. So that's where that came from. I remember a, a teacher telling me once that um, you had the best way to learn how to do that is to sit on the right hand. <laughs> I did so that. So the left hand has to I work. I used to do that, yeah. Uh-huh. When I was learning those Joplin pieces, because it was so difficult, because there was no way you could learn, well, for me, there was no way I could play both at the same time at first. So I would sit on my right hand. And my father would sit there and watch me, and if I would move my right hand away from under my, from my legs, you know, he'd get on me about that. So, Wow. Yep. So did you grow up playing ragtime, or were you playing other types of music as well? I wanted to play classical music. I started with that. and uh, How old I, were you at the time? I started taking lessons when I was 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, before that, I think I used to listen to, I was, grew up in a very Irish family, so I would listen to the records that my parents would play and figure out the chord changes to that. But then when I heard, uh, I heard Beethoven, and I liked Beethoven piano a lot, and I just never got technically good enough to do that. And the piano at the house didn't sound good enough to, to pull that off either. So when I watched the movie The Sting, of course, everyone knows about the ragtime background on the movie The Sting, Marvin Hamlish and all that, and uh, that syncopated piano sound really got me. And the way that the attack, the, the piano attack, was very uh, beautiful to me. Where a lot of people would think of that as sloppy, I thought of that as this beautiful sound. So I got into that, and then, then I got, how did you say it? How did I get into blues? Seduced by seduced. the blues. Seduced. She came up with the <laughs> phrase, I got seduced by the blues. How did that happen? I had this guy, his name was Carla Elton, they call him Little Daddy. Uh-huh. And he saw me at Guitar Center when I was really young, 14, and uh, said, I have a gig for you uh, over at Biddy Mulligan's, which was up on the north side. It's no longer there. It was a very famous blues club with mm-hmm. Eddie C. Campbell. And my father drove me up there, and I sat there and played blues all night. And I remember distinctly the smell of the blues club. Okay, describe that for us. Sweat. <laughs> in a word. Because we played so long and it was so hot and crowded in there, but I liked it. And I liked that these guys, man, these guys were older and they had been around. And Did you bring a handkerchief for the uh, piano? No, but I wore a white, white dress shirt all buttoned up and black pants. And, okay. And I uh, brought too many keyboards and tried to play too much. And I looked like a geek, and I probably was a geek. <laughs> uh, but I remember that these guys, man, they acted like they did. Uh, on the re- 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. You're listening to WDCB 90.9 FM and WDCB.org. Can't call no friend My woman 
was crying And it's my fault again I've gone evil I've gone evil ain't that a shame For all, all my troubles I'll only have myself to blame The dark sound was ringing And I answered the call What went down I do remember But just why Now for all, all my troubles I only have myself to blame Thank you so much, very much, thank you. All right, 
Marty Salmon and Rick King live from Piano Forte on WDCB, 1335 South Michigan Avenue here in Chicago. And uh, what a beautiful song that was, Marty. Thank you. I'd love to hear more about how you compose tunes, and that one especially, the dynamics were beautiful, and the texture um, provided by Rick King there was awesome as well. So. You stop bad, huh? <laughs> we kind of know each other after all this time. Yeah, you know? now you've been playing together, what, 20 years, is it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It turns out that my daughter's mom and him went to high school together. And for years she was saying to me, you need to meet this Rick King. He plays drums with Coco Taylor. Yeah, well, it happened one day. And we eventually ran into each other and started playing gigs. We started a band together and a couple bands together and multiple projects. And, and here we are. Okay. Well, on DCB. Can I say something? Absolutely. I just want to say how much I love your station and thank you because you guys save me in traffic. You guys <laughs> save me when I'm cooking at home, which I don't do often enough. You save me when I'm waking up and when I'm going to bed. I listen to you guys constantly. And, and if you guys are, you know, you play the best music with the most variety. And if you guys ever leave, I'm going to be very upset. So. Well, we might just ask you to um, record that. <laughs> well, we got it down now. <laughs> all right. Whatever I can do to help you guys, I'm all about it because you guys are well, really doing you. something great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, but back to the song you just played because it fascinates me. Tell me about um, what the, the composition, how did you come to compose that song and how do you compose generally? Is there a method you have or does it just, does the muse smile on you one day and it happens? I actually write most of my songs on guitar. I'm a terrible hmm. guitar player. And that's why I can write them on guitar, because it stops me from trying to write too much. Really? And, uh, and that's some, I mean, sometimes I work hard on writing. I'm not a, uh, I don't write a lot. I wish I did. Stevie Wonder said he writes a song every day, no matter if he likes it or not. Wow. I'm lucky if I get two or three a year. But I hope that they're okay when I do, excuse me, when I do write two or three a year, I hope that they're, they're quality. But they come differently. Most of the time, it comes very quickly. And sometimes I love... You know, I'm not a big technology fan, but I do love the iPhone and the, and the new phones because they have recorders on them. And when you come up with an idea, you can sit down and get it down. Sometimes I'll just play and, you know, it comes just off the cuff, like freestyle. I'll just come up and make them up. I'm really good uh, at rhyming on the fly sometimes, especially on the third set of a gig late night. I start to make up my own lyrics quite a bit. And sometimes if I get them down, then I have it. But there's no real rhyme or reason to. Sometimes I just look back and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I just came up with that. So I wish it happened all the time. Well, one uh, other thing I wanted to make sure that we were able to talk about today is um, this, uh, speaking of writing, the, this book that you have um, produced, Blues Keyboard Method. Yes. Hal Leonard Publishing did this for me, and I have to thank Bruce Iglauer of Alligator Records for suggesting me for this. But they wanted something that you could pick up as a, as a keyboard player, preferably if you can read, because there are uh, music notes, for lack of a better term, in there. I can't read what they are. They had somebody transcribe them for me. But they wanted you to be able to play any style of blues, you know, and have enough knowledge. So I figured, why don't we come up with something that if you went to a jam night in Chicago and you were called up to play, you would have enough skills you could get by any style on any kind of keyboard. So what kinds of styles do you... Uh do you have in the book? There's traditional shuffles, there's slow blues, there's uh, New Orleans rumba, there's uh, Chicago soul, like the Tyrone Davis style, there's James Brown funk. Uh, there's pretty much, that's pretty much all you really have in, in the Chicago thing, you know. Anything that you hear played in the Chicago clubs, I think you could, if you, if you did this, you get a basic knowledge of it. But the main, more important thing is to listen to music. I mean, even with this book, there's a, a list in there of, of uh, suggested listening. Uh -huh. But when students come to me and they say, I want to play blues piano, well, what blues records do you have? I don't have any. I just want you to teach me. Well, you can't <laughs> learn it unless you have listened to it. You have to listen to it over and over again. So this is just a guide to what I hope people are listening to. And there are audio examples that you can download on it. I think there's about 99 of them. When you were growing up, were there certain blues pianists whose style you really liked? I never listened to blues piano when I was a kid. Uh -huh. When I got into playing blues, I, like my first blues gig, I had never heard a blues record before. Really? And I'm, I'm glad they don't have recordings of this gig. Uh, <laughs> because I would hate to hear it. Uh, but, you know, I really, the first person I saw that blew my mind was Professor Longhair. And a friend of mine showed me a video of Longhair singing Tipitina. 
with his yodeling voice, and I thought, this is crazy. I want nothing to do with that. And there was something about the rhythm and, and the way his, it was a syncopated kind of thing, just like the ragtime. So I got kind of caught up in that. I actually got in more in the New Orleans piano than I did Chicago blues players. It took Buddy Guy to get on me about that to where I just discovered, you know, after starting with Buddy, Otis Spann was really playing something special, and I, had not just, I hadn't paid enough attention to it. So James Booker from New Orleans... Professor Longhair, and then in Chicago, Otis Spann. Those, those would be the three, if you talk about when I play blues style of music, that I would be, probably be the most influenced by. Well, coming off that conversation, then I would love to hear some more blues, perhaps inspired by one of the pianists you most admire. Okay. Let's play Tipitina. Awesome. All right. All right. This can give me a good excuse to play Tipitina. Okay, sounds good. This is Marty Salmon and Rick King. We're broadcasting live this hour from Piano Forte, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. You're listening to WDCB 90.9 FM.
Thank you very much. Marty Salmon and Rick King live from Piano Forte on WDCB, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And what a great rendition, gentlemen, of Tipitina. Well done. I'd like to hear more about how you two found each other. You want to talk about that, Rick? Um, really, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, Giles Corey and myself, were looking to start an original band. Giles at that time was with Billy Branch and the Sons of Blues. I was touring with Coco Taylor, and uh, we wanted to do an original project. So I called around town, and I kept hearing about this young cat named Marty Salmon that played a lot. Some of the people even said overplayed. And I said, perfect, that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> and why was that something you were looking for? Um, I wanted there to be a lot of energy, and I figured I would rather start with people that could play a lot, and then as we matured, we would settle into something okay. rather than try and get it the other way around. Do I still overplay? I didn't say you overplayed. You <laughs> I'm just asking. I'm insecure about check that. Check the recording. <laughs> that, so, that some a, people said that you overplayed, and I said, I like perfect. That. I like That's that. why I wanted John And that team. was the past tense. Yes. yes. Right, right, right. But uh, so our first gig together was at the original Checkerboard Lounge, uh, thanks to the proprietor, L.C. Thurman, who knew me from playing with Vance Kelly, where I learned everything. And we all joke about it the cats in my generation that got to play with Vance and still play with Vance occasionally, and we call it Vance Kelly University, so it's VKU. Oh, yeah. oh, that's great. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heck of an institution. Um, so, you can't uh, stop dancing when you listen to Vance. It's amen. ridiculous. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He's, he's a great entertainer and a great person and a great teacher. Um, and they gave us a shot down there at the checkerboard to do original music, and uh, that's where Marty and I first met. And it was, you know, it, I have to say, you know, from what I remember, it was pretty magical. It was just like automatic, you know, that we spoke the same language. And then, you know, the more we hung out, we, you know, had a lot of the same views and a lot of the same, same sense of humor that keeps things going for 20 years. Musical and otherwise. Yes. Uh -huh, yes. Uh -huh. Well, you play together brilliantly and the dynamics are wonderful and the interplay is great and you, you've played long enough together now that you can anticipate where Marty's going to some degree. Anyway. Absolutely, absolutely. So. And, and it's, it, it is still a guessing game um, well, because we, be don't, we, we was, never though. use a set list. Uh, <laughs> you know, we talked just before we started broadcasting that uh, we had just done some openers for Buddy Guy out on the West Coast, up in Washington State and uh, whatnot, and up and down the West Coast, and we never use a set list. And you know, sometimes people are surprised by that, but I think we're coming from that school where you, know, you really gotta feel what you're playing, and you really don't know, even through a sound check, you don't know how you're gonna feel three hours later, and you don't know what the energy of that room is gonna feel like until you're actually right in front of them. And, um, you know, Marty's never let us down in that regard ever. You know, he, he calls tunes like, like Vance Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Marty Salmon, you, huh? <laughs> I feel like I just got a degree from VKU all yeah. over again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of Buddy Guy, though, you've been playing with uh, Buddy now, Marty, for... Uh, 13 years. Really? Yes, wow. ma'am. And before that, you were with Otis Rush. Otis Rush and Phil Guy. All right. Phil Guy was Buddy's younger brother. Uh, he was the one that when Buddy and Junior went to Africa, it was the State Department sent him to Africa in 69, for an example of African-American music coming from the U.S. And they wanted Buddy and Junior for the traditional blues, and they wanted Phil Guy. I know I'm kind of getting away from the question, but... No, no, I... I like more people to realize Phil Guy's contribution, because Phil was the one that they brought, because he was younger and he was the funky version. He was the one with the the jumpsuits and did the James Brown, so that they had a full example of African-American music in Chicago. So kind of like Syl Johnson to Jimmy oh, Johnson. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Perfect example, mm -hmm. yes. So I was doing gigs between Phil and Otis and then trying to do my own band. And, you know, it's, it's tough to do all that, doing three gigs a day. And then Buddy, Phil called me and said, well, uh, Buddy wants you to work. Y'all leave Thursday. <laughs> well, so I showed up Thursday. It was a rehearsal. But I had my bags packed because I didn't know. You know, they don't give me any information. You know, y'all leave wow. Thursday. Okay. It's 13 years later, and uh, I just now feel like I'm starting to play the gig the way I should. You know, it's a learning experience. It's constantly, and Buddy is very patient and very encouraging about 
how you grow as a musician. And if you continue to grow, I think you keep the gig. So hence I've kept it 13 years. I think that's a long time, but longer than a lot of the people have played with him. Well, we uh, referred before to Otis Rush, and I wanted to make sure that um, we talked a little bit about him um, as not only a person you played with, but uh, in view of the tribute that you'll be participating in Sunday night uh, at the uh, Chicago Blues Festival mm -hmm. with, with the cast of thousands who are honoring Otis some Rush. Some of my he childhood heroes are on this gig with, with me. T and tell me about some of them. Jimmy Johnson, he, uh, you can mention Jimmy Johnson was uh, Tom Holland gave me one time, after my mother had passed away, a cassette of Jimmy Johnson, Barroom Preacher. And I did not, did not take, it was a cassette, remember those? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anybody still have any of them? I, I played this thing over and over again in my car forever until it worn out. And it served me right to suffer and uh, cold, cold feeling and all that. So he's on it, Eddie Clearwater, uh, Ronnie Earl, um, and then also Bob Levis, you know, not, not a lot of people know him, but he was on the first record I ever bought with my own money. I bought Otis Rush live in Europe, so I got to tour with Bob Levis wow. and Otis, which to me, I'm kind of, I get kind of starstruck by that when I get to travel with guys that made records 30 years ago that I bought. You know, that's, that's meaningful. So to have him come into town and doing that, I think that's wonderful. I don't know if Otis will be there, but I'm going to rehearsal after this uh, broadcast here to rehearse for that. And then playing at Buddy Guys tonight, if anyone's listening, from 8 to 9. But I'm excited about this thing Sunday because we, the set list that they've put together and the, the group of musicians they've put together is incredible. And it is, you know, we've all seen tribute shows that, that kind of can be, you know, a rat race because there's so many people on it. We just right. seen one in New Orleans, uh, a tribute to B.B. King, that if you looked at all the artists that were on there and how organized it was, somebody put some serious work into it. Well, Dick Sherman has put some serious work into this tribute, and I think it's going to go off real well. And I, I think it's the most show of love we can give for, for Mr. Rush. So. And I think the, uh, the uh, love-in starts at 5 o'clock uh, Sunday night with a set by Ronnie Earl. True. And then uh, Eddie Clearwater, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, everybody gets on stage around 8.30 or so? Uh, 8.30, yes. Yeah, Sunday yeah. night. All right, should be a great time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you also mentioned that you have a gig uh, at Buddy's as well. Tonight, uh, we're at Buddy's Legends. They, they started their Blues Fest celebration a day early. So there you got music going on there now, and it'll, it'll go all, all day, all night until Sunday evening. Uh, but we'll be there from 8 to 9 with my full band tonight. All right. And does that include a horn section as well? Not this time. All right. No. Sometimes we do have a horn section, but this time we're just as a four-piece because it's a short gig. So. Tonight we'll have Marvin Little on bass and Randall Matthews on guitar. Mm -hmm. And Shane, the washboard man. We have a washboard. He was supposed to be a surprise guest, but we have a killer washboard player sitting in tonight. Excellent. Too. Well, I think we have, uh, we have time for perhaps a war story that you'd like to share with your time touring with uh, Buddy Guy and with Otis Russ, the two giants of the blues. Any interesting stories to tell from those experiences? I had one, and I can't remember it. Let me think. I was sitting here earlier today thinking about one. Um... I think the time the buddy blew my mind the most was when we were at this outdoor arena that was kind of like a covered, it was kind of like a Ravinia type of place, but there was a fence behind the pavilion area. So there's a seating area, and then there's a fence, and then there's a lawn area. So they're sitting on the lawn, and Buddy always walks the crowd with his guitar, and it's screaming loud, and he's having a blast, and everybody's having a blast. And I see him looking out, and there's all these people saying, come on out to the lawn, and he's, he's looking at the fence, and I'm on a stage looking at him like, there's no way he's gonna make this, right? He didn't miss a note and jumped the damn fence. And over the fence he went without a problem, and the poor guitar tech could not get over the fence, and he, you know, he kinda looks like me, he's my age. You know, he's a good friend of mine, so I can tell the story, but he's trying to get over the fence, and Buddy's already halfway up the lawn. And he come back, and, and he just gave me a look, like, give me a wink, like, I, I can do this, you know. <laughs> That's the kind of experience you have with Buddy Guy. He's turning 80 years old this year, and I... In August, I think, right? In July 30th. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. And um, I, I've never seen someone age where they get younger as they get older. And that's amazing. There's no hope for me jumping fences at this age, let alone at 80 years old. So I would have been like the guitar tech trying to hump over the fence. <laughs> well, I guess the blues can keep you young, huh? It sure does. It's working for him, and I hope it works well for me. And do you know what uh, plans he's got to celebrate his birthday? We'll be at Ravinia with Jeff Beck, and we're oh, doing wow. a whole tour with Jeff Beck this summer. 
Uh, I'll be away from my house for nine weeks. That's the longest I've ever been gone, and most of that's going to be with Jeff Beck. Uh, this particular performance at Ravinia, Jeff Beck is going to open for Buddy, which is the only one of on that tour, because out of respect for him for his birthday. And I've already been told there's no guest list, so if you're going to call me for guest list, don't call me. <laughs> because there's so many family and friends that want to be at that, which I think is great, and that's what he deserves. So I'm looking forward to that. And then there will be a party at the club the next evening. I will be already on the road getting ready for his next performance. But 80 years old, my God, you know, what can you say? Well, and he still gets up on stage nearly every night to mm -hmm. greet the crowd and to make sure they band on stage is keeping their chops. Oh, uh, he's got everyone should. on high alert down there. You, know? <laughs> you never know when he's going to walk up. And uh -huh, I uh -huh. set up my keyboards down there kind of facing away from, from the bar. And I know that it's time for him to come out feeling a hand on my shoulder. All and right. I look up you know and there he is smiling. I'm like, uh -huh. all right, it's time to play some good blues. As only Buddy can smile. <laughs> yes. I call it a million dollar smile. Even though he was not making money, he still had a million dollar smile. Well, I want to thank you so much, Marty Salmon and Rick King. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank you. And, uh, but, you know, we can't let you go without hearing one more. I'll do one more original for you. This, All right. This is called, thank you, this is called My Mind is a Mess. All righty. Marty Salmon and Rick King, live at Piano Forte, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. DCB, I guess.
Thank you, Leslie. I thank WDCB and Piano Forte Foundation. What a great afternoon. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Rick King. You've been enjoying the music of Marty Salmon and Rick King in a live performance from Piano Forte in Chicago. Marty is appearing this evening at Buddy Guy's Legends and Sunday night at the Chicago Blues Festival as part of the tribute to Otis Rush. For more information on his recordings and appearances, visit his website, news.martysalmon.com. And his last name, incidentally, is spelled S-A-M-M-O-N. This broadcast is made possible through the cooperation of the Piano Forte Foundation, a nonprofit whose mission is to preserve and promote piano culture. Piano Forte is presenting a live concert tomorrow night with Susie Blue and the Lonesome Fellas, featuring vocalist Solitaire Miles. More information on that event and others is available online at pianofortefoundation.org. Our thanks to Thomas Zoles, Victor Lejeune, and the entire crew here at the Piano Forte Studios for their help with today's broadcast. Thanks also to the folks at WDCB for their production help, including Dan Bindert, Clarice Cavouris, Bill Tennant, and Barry Winograd. And thanks again also to Marty Salmon and to Rick King for sharing their music with us today. I'm Leslie Karras. Thanks for listening, and let's send it back to the studio now to Barry Winograd for more DCB Jazz.